Uh, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you that it is truth. Uh, often in the world today, we don't hear truth. We hear opinions. We hear deceptions and lies and agendas. But every Sunday morning, every time we read the Bible, we are confronted with truth. And so we pray that your truth would change us for Christ's sake and his great glory. Amen. So how are you doing with temptation lately? Uh, I'm doing, uh, I'm an expert at temptation. Um, but how, uh, only joking, uh, but how are you doing? How am I doing with temptation? Temptation is the enticement towards sin and wrong and evil. Uh, we know that the, no one is exempt from temptation. Interestingly, nowadays, many people think temptation is not a bad thing. And in fact, many people think temptation is something quite exciting to be embraced. Uh, there's a TV series called Temptation Island, I believe. <laughs> you can buy temptation chocolates. There are actually temptation resorts in the Caribbean that offer options for leaving your routine behind and embracing your sexy side. There are novels and movies about temptation. There are websites whose sole aim is to tempt you towards unhelpful, damaging, illicit sexual activity. Uh, you could argue that the entire advertising industry is built some way or another around temptation. So how are you and I doing with temptation? lately. Well, in today's passage, we see, among other things, Jesus uh, being baptized by the devil, uh, by John the Baptist, and being tempted by the devil. Now, last week, a, a cruise ship uh, collided with a cargo ship in Cape Town Harbor. Uh, two big, powerful ships came into contact. Two big, powerful ships collided. Uh, fortunately, only minor damages and probably due to the wind. But in today's passage, we see two massive powers, Jesus and the devil colliding, coming into contact, and one comes out victorious. In fact, since the beginning of human history, we've been waiting for a human being who will be victorious over Satan. From the beginning of time, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we've been waiting for a human being who will crush Satan's head. That was promised, and perhaps Jesus is just that person we've been waiting for. So this morning, we see Jesus' baptism, genealogy, and temptation, and we will see that they're all connected. <clears throat> now, let me just say two important things to remember when we're studying the Bible. Number one, when we read the Bible, we, we must always realize that the Bible is not about me. The Bible is about Jesus. So this passage that we're looking at this morning is not primarily about us and how we fight temptation. No, it's about Jesus and who he is and what he's done. However, there are some lessons we can learn. The second thing I want to tell you this morning is when we read the Bible, we should always ask the question, where have I heard this before? So I may be reading about altars or sacrifice or darkness or clouds or earthquakes or floods or bread, and I always need to ask the question, well, where have I heard about this before? Because if I ask that question, uh, where have I heard this about before in the Bible, it will help me to connect the Bible dots, because what has gone before in the Bible is always helpful to understand what is happening in the passage I'm reading at present. And today, in today's passage, that question is particularly helpful to ask. So we're back in Luke's Gospel, King for All. Uh, you'll, you'll remember that Luke wrote his Gospel, this book in the Bible, so that we can have certainty about Jesus. The first two chapters were, are called the birth narratives. Uh, they're all about Jesus' uh, birth and, and growing up. In, in the beginning of chapter 3, John the Baptist has announced that one greater than him is coming, one who will... Uh, be God's king. He's not worthy to, to tie his sandals. One who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then in, in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus rocks up on the scene. 
And so the first, so point number one as we come to today's passage, uh, the sons of God. And that's not a typo. It is plural, the sons of God. I'll explain what I mean. Well, firstly note, uh, did you see how the Trinity is involved in Jesus' baptism? God the Son is baptized. God the Father speaks from heaven. And God the Holy Spirit descends like a dove upon Jesus. Uh, and note what God the Father says in verse 22. As, as Jesus is baptized and praying in verse 22, uh, God the Father says, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And God's words here are massively significant. See, the Old Testament promised that the great king who would come one day, who would establish the forever kingdom, whose throne would last forever, he would be the son of God. And he would be filled with the spirit. So for instance, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 14, the promise of the great king, it says this, God says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. In Psalm chapter 2, the great psalm about God's king ruling forever and smashing his enemies. It says in verse 7 and 8, The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. In Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1, it says, Behold my servant who am I delight, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring justice to the nations. See, the great king who would come, who would bring justice to the nations, would be God's son, beloved son, and it would be filled with the Spirit. Isn't it interesting? God the Father says, you are my beloved son, to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. You see, there comes Jesus, God's son, and he's baptized by John and the Spirit comes down. Jesus is God's great king come into our world and Jesus being baptized by John he's identifying himself with the people he's come to save and it's as if God is anointing him from heaven as king in the old testament the kings were anointed by oil yeah Jesus is anointed with the holy spirit as God's king and God confirms that this man is indeed my beloved son the great king who will rule forever See, what we have in today's passage is Luke showing us that Jesus is the f true faithful Son of God, God's Son, where the other sons of God have failed. Now, before we get to the genealogy, just note Jesus' temptation account. L note what it says in chapter 4, verse 1, and ask yourself the question, where have I heard this before in the Bible? Chapter 4, verse 1, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. See, where have you heard about the wilderness before? Where have you heard the number 40 before? Well, if you've read the Old Testament, you will know that Israel was tempted in the wilderness for 40 years. One year for every day, that the spies were in the promised land. And what, did, what happened to Israel? Well, they failed, they grumbled, they complained. Did you know that Israel was known as a son of God? Remember what God said about Israel? Out of Israel I have called, out of Egypt I have called my son. Israel was known as the son of God as a nation. But Israel as a nation, known as the Son of God, failed to trust God. They failed to live up to God's standards. They failed to bring blessings to the nations. They failed. Now look at the genealogy. Now normally genealogies come right at the beginning of the book like Matthew's Gospel. And it ends with a human figure. But yeah, Luke puts the genealogy right in the middle of the story. And... The, the end figure is God himself. But why? Well, Luke wants to show us that Jesus is the son of God, and yet there is another son of God who also failed. 
Look at chapter, uh, look at three, chapter three, verse twenty-three. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about thirty years of age. And by the way, King David in the Old Testament was thirty when he became king. Uh, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli. See, they supposed Jesus was Joseph's biological son, but he wasn't. Remember what the angel Gabriel said to Mary in chapter one that Jesus would be the son of the Most High. You see, Jesus is the son of God, of course. But notice that Luke traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam and to God. So verse 38, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Interesting. So if Jesus was ultimately the son of God, the son of God. But Adam, did you note, according to the genealogy, is also a son of God. Not the son of God in the divine sense, but he's a son of God in that God created him. Adam, the son of God, it says in the genealogy. But you know what? Adam was a son of God who also failed in the Garden of Eden. Adam, you see, son of God failed. Israel, as a nation, the son of God failed. And in fact, every single human being that has ever lived on, on this planet has failed has succumbed to temptation, has not lived up to God's standards. We all fail. We are all weak. We are all powerless in the battle against the devil. The devil is too powerful for, for, for us. We need a king. We need a son of God who won't fail. We need a king, that is, we need a son of God who will conquer Satan. We need someone to overcome Satan for us because we can't. He's too powerful. The sons of God, point one. So point two, the temptations of Satan. Note chapter four, verse one again. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. And for 40 days being tempted by the devil. Now the Bible, you will know, assumes the existence of God and it also assumes the existence of the devil. The devil is opposed to God and opposed to God's people. That means he's opposed to you, doesn't like you. He wants to see you destroyed, wants to see you discouraged, wants to see you and your family losing your way. The devil is opposed to God and God's people. And here at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, the devil has the opportunity to mess everything up. Now, I was at a wedding yesterday, and uh, the bride walked down the aisle, and um, the, the, the groom started crying. And the minister said, said to the groom, you're a mess. You know, all the makeup is running. You're a mess. I felt quite sorry, man. Shame. And the poor guy was just loved his, he loved his bride so much. You are at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. The devil has the opportunity to mess everything up. The devil has the opportunity to stop God's salvation plan, to thwart God's eternal purposes to, for him to save his people. And to redeem a people for himself. Yeah, at the very beginning, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, the devil has the opportunity to frustrate the eternal purposes and plan of God by just getting Jesus to sin once. Because if Jesus just has to sin once, when he goes to the cross, he cannot die for my sin, he can and must die for his own sin. So here at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, the, the devil tries to get Jesus to sin just one time. And everything will be lost. Everything will be thwarted. So Jesus, full of the Spirit, is led by the Spirit to be tempted and tested by Satan. Jesus is going to face the time of trial. And Jesus, please note, Jesus is tested not because he lacks God's presence or leading. Jesus is tested in the midst of God's presence and leading and care. See, being a Christian, by the way, being a person full of the Spirit, does not mean no testing. Often being a Christian brings more testing and trial and temptation. And, but remember how Jesus taught us to pray. He said, Lord, please, he taught us to pray like this, Lord, lead us not into temptation. 
In other words, lead us not into the time of testing, but if the time of testing does come, please deliver us from the evil one. And so even the Son of God does not exempt Jesus from being tempted. Uh, we, Of course, we mostly fail and fall into temptation. But of course, this passage is not about us. It's about Jesus. This passage is not really five strategies for Christians to employ to fight temptation. This passage is about Jesus and how he overcomes the devil. Note how subtle and cunning and deceptive the temptations are. Temptation 1, verse 2. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. See, Jesus was tempted to pursue a good thing in the wrong way rather than trusting God to provide. Bread is a good thing. Bread's not a bad thing. We need bread. We need food. Food is a good thing. It's a gift from God. But Jesus was tempted to not trust in God's provision and make an alternate plan, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, just like Israel in the wilderness. Remember what happened to Israel in the wilderness? God had just rescued them from Egypt through ten supernatural, miraculous plagues. He had opened the Red Sea, literally. I mean, if there was ever any doubt that God loved you, they saw it. And then not five minutes later, they're saying, we are hungry, we need food, God doesn't care for us, we want to go back to Egypt. Why did you bring us here? You're a sorry excuse for a leader, Moses. And they were discontent with God's provision. But before we condemn those ungodly people who complained all the time, am I not similar? See, and how often than not are we tempted to pursue good things in the wrong way rather than trust in God's provision, which he has promised? Food is great, but see, stealing money to eat better food is bad. Sexual intimacy in marriage is good, but harmful outside of the context of marriage. Work is good, but being a work addict is bad. You see, we are tempted to, to not trust in God's provision and make an alternate plan. See, Jesus was tempted to pursue a good thing in the wrong way rather than trust in God to provide. Temptation number two, verse five. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Um, uh, maybe he had Instagram, you know, showing him pictures, I'm not sure, but he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, to, to you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. And again, Jesus was tempted to pursue glory and power in an ungodly way, rather than entrusting himself to God's plan and to God's timing. Jesus was promised a crown without the cross. Jesus was promised the gain without the pain. He was tempted to bypass the cross, to get all the glory and the kingdom without going to the cross. Does this sound familiar? You can be the next boss, the world says. You can be the next boss of your company if you would just turn a blind eye. You can have all the money and the overseas holidays simply by ignoring the truth. Pastor, you can be loved and liked by all. Just don't preach about sin. See, you can have all this. But just don't put God first. Put something else first. And the Bible says that if you put something else before God, you may as well be a Satanist for all the good that it's going to do for you. 
So you can have all this if you just refuse to put God first. Live for the world, live for yourself, or live for the devil. It doesn't matter, but you just don't put God first. And by the way, I think that Satan was lying. I don't think he had absolute power to give all the kingdoms to Jesus. But Jesus was tempted to pursue glory and power in an ungodly way rather than entrusting himself to God's plan and God's timing. All the kingdom and all the power would be his one day, of course. But God's plan, God's timing. Temptations 3, verse 9. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. That's an Old Testament quote. And verse 11, another Old Testament quote. He, on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus was tempted to promote himself by putting God to the test. By the way, did you notice how well Satan knows the Bible? He's quoting the Bible to Jesus. He knows it. He's memorized it. You know, just because a preacher stands on a stage and has a Bible in his hand and he's quoting random verses doesn't mean anything. In fact, most heretics and false teachers, like the devil, know the Bible extremely well. Possibly better than you and I. Their churches are full, but they twist scripture and they quote them out of context, just like the devil to Jesus. Because they want, to, because they want to suit their own greed. So Jesus is quoted by, with the use of scripture, the wrong use of scripture. Jesus is tempted to promote himself, you know, throw yourself off the temple. Let God rescue you. Possibly all the people at the temple will see that. And well, what a spectacle. And yay for Jesus. Jesus was tempted to arbitrarily put his life in danger so God would be forced to rescue him. That is putting God to the test. If you do this, God, I will. Trying to twist God's arm to Get him to do something for you to promote yourself. Does that perhaps sound familiar? Lord, if you just provide for this, I'll become a missionary in Sudan tomorrow. Well, note the cunning uh, temptation. Note how deceptive the devil is. It's verse 3. If you are the son of God, Surely the Son of God should not go hungry. Surely a Christian should not have a hard time. Surely a Christian's children should not get sick. Verse, nine, uh, verse, three, and verse 3 and verse 9 again. Surely the Son of God will be rescued from danger. See, he's saying, if you are the Son of God, you should be able to do these things. Come on, Jesus. Surely the Son of God wouldn't go hungry. Prove yourself. And how would Jesus respond? Well, let me ask the question, how do we respond most times? So the problem is most times we fall into temptation. Because Satan is stronger than us. We would fail every time. If I was there in the wilderness without food for 40 days, I would turn, if I could, the stones into bread. And sushi. <laughs> and some coke. See, we would fail every time. And we do fail. So thirdly, the victory of Christ. Thanks. The, you know, I think it was Aristotle. I read this. I, I, I think it was Aristotle who said, the toughest victory is the victory over self. Now, before you win any other battle and conquer any other enemy, make sure you conquer yourself. And here we see Jesus having the victory. Verse 4, Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. 
In other words, Jesus said, trusting God and listening to his words is more important than food. Trusting God and listening to his words is more important than food. Verse 8, And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, give your allegiance to God only and entrust yourself to his timing. Give your allegiance to God only and entrust yourself to his timing. Verse 12, And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, Entrust yourself to God's faithfulness in the good times and the tough times. Entrust yourself to God's faithfulness in the good times and the tough times. See, Jesus countered Satan's temptations with the truth. The truth of God's word. To Jesus, what the Bible says is what God says. That's why he quoted from the Old Testament. He encountered the lies and the deception and the seduction with the truth. By the way, this is why reading your Bible and coming to church is so important, because we need to hear the truth. Who is going to tell you the truth? Well, God's going to tell you the truth in, from the Bible. That's where you're going to find truth. Notice that Jesus did not negotiate or argue or compromise with temptation. He dealt decisively with temptation with the truth. You know, when we give in to temptation and when we sin, we know it always snowballs. But Jesus encountered temptation with the truth about sin and about life and about how the world operates. See, the truth is that adultery destroys marriages. That's the truth. You can call your resort temptation resort and have nice pictures on your website but the truth is that adultery destroys marriages that's the truth the truth is that pornography harms friendships and the closest friendships that's truth the truth is that stealing money will send your conscience and mess up your life the truth is that sexual intimacy outside marriage enslaves you to your lust See, Jesus encountered temptation with the truth. And he did not sin. And that meant, and it means, that Jesus is qualified to be our Savior. So that when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for sin, he didn't die for his own sin. No, he died for my sin and he died for your sin so that we can be forgiven. And there on the cross, when he died and rose again, he won the ultimate victory over Satan. For the first time ever, in the first time in human history, a son of God, in fact, the son of God, was victorious over the devil. The victory of Christ. Fourthly and lastly, the example for Christians of course, this passage is primarily about uh, Jesus and who he is, the Son of God, God's King. Because remember, the King was promised to be God's Son, who is qualified to save us. Uh, but what does the passage say about you and me? Well, it says, firstly, that you better make sure, and I better make sure, that we're trusting in Jesus. If you're trusting in yourself to overcome Satan, you have massive problems because Satan is too powerful. But Jesus has overcome Satan for you. So make sure you're trusting Jesus. If your confidence is in Jesus, you're on the winning team. And you'll be part of his kingdom that will rule forever. But it also shows us that we need to counter Satan's lies and deceit with the truth of God's word. You see, we need truth. We constantly need to reprogram our minds to reorientate our minds with the truth. The world and Netflix is not going to give us truth. Only God is going to give you and I truth. 
Remember what Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. In fact, that quote is from an Old Testament passage. Listen to what the rest of the verse says in the Old Testament. In uh, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, this is the verse that Jesus quoted from. And Moses says, and God humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that people do not live by bread alone, but people live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, Moses says, don't trust in manna, don't trust in bread, don't even trust in miracle bread, trust in God and his words. Don't trust in your money, in your bank balance, in your safety net, in your pension fund, in your share portfolio, or these, these, or even though these are not bad things, they can be very good things, but don't put your trust in them, put your trust in God and his words. Let God and his words give you the deepest satisfaction in life, because they will last forever. So my encouragement to you and to me this morning is, number one, put your confidence in Jesus. He has overcome Satan for you. Make sure you're on the winning team. And secondly, devote yourself to the truth, to hearing the truth, to reading the truth, to singing the truth, to discussing the truth. Yesterday we met for a men's breakfast and we heard the truth explained, the truth that the kingdom of the Lord will last forever and will rule over the kingdoms of the world. It was so encouraging to hear truth. Devote yourself to the truth. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we are aware that when Jesus was tempted by Satan, two massive powers came into contact and collided in the wilderness. But actually, there was never any doubt who would be victorious. Because Jesus is your great king, the son of God. Lord, thank you that Jesus is stronger and more powerful than us. Thank you that Jesus won the great victory over Satan, ultimately at the cross, where he paid the price for our sin and for our falling and failing. Thank you that in Jesus, our sins are forgiven and we are accepted into your family. And we are given the Holy Spirit to help us to embrace the truth and to stand firm. Please help us to put our trust in Jesus. Please help us in temptation not to distrust your provision and care. And please help us to devote ourselves as a church family to the truth of the Bible. And we pray that as a result, we would not fall into Satan's schemes, but we would live a more joyful life, knowing that you are God and that you care, and that your plan and purposes are being worked out in the world and in our lives. And we ask this all in the name of the great Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.